Lord, may the words that I speak be your words today. Amen. Now, this parable of the rich fool illustrates rather what's been troubling me lately. Are we financially secure? Now, if my preparation goes well, and it's God's will, I'll start my training to be an ordained deacon. And then, if it's God's calling, I'll be ordained to be a priest the following year. I'll be working voluntarily in this church and in this diocese. So I'll give up work, and we'll need to support ourselves on our pensions. And our work doesn't know this yet, so uh, between you and me, this... um... (laughs) Linda's just retired, Ellie's going to go off to university, and my pension's going to be called on eight years early. But do we have enough money to live off? How much do we need? Do we feel secure? The parable of the rich fool, and I would hasten to add, I am not rich, but I am a bit of a fool, has made me realise that I'm focusing on the wrong thing. And it's all down, really, to my trust in God. So what is money? Money's just a recognition of a contract between two people or a business. And that's all it is. In fact, I haven't actually handled money for about three years. It's here. It's on my phone. It's not even physical anymore. But like it or not, money's in all our lives. We earn it. We have a job that pays us for the skills that we have that we bring to a business. And we save it so we can save for something that we want. And we put some of it aside for a rainy day. And we save for our pension. But money doesn't have a life. It can't act on its own. It can't do good deeds. And it can't commit crimes. Basically, it's neither good nor bad. Money can do what you tell it to do. So when we read in the Bible... Money is the root of all evil. I think what this really means is it's the person that makes it evil through their love of it. Now, 1 Timothy says, For we brought nothing into this world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith. So I'll come back to that later part in a moment. Now, most certainly there is a moral question over poverty and wealth in nations. But that's not my subject today. Today is about how we use what God has given us. So how much do we need then? Well, God is very concerned about our interpretation and the use of money. So much so that there are over 2,000 references to money in the Bible. So how much do we need? Well, 21 years ago now, I was made redundant overnight. we just bought a house up in Newcastle, and we'd rented our house out in Guildford. The company I worked for, Movers there, went spectacularly bust overnight. And I received just statutory redundancy of £1,000. Now, that's not enough to pay one month's mortgage payments, let alone anything else. Now, that situation focuses the mind somewhat. Now, I was fortunate. I applied for various underwriting jobs, and my name was picked out by one of my friends from another insurance company. We travelled back down south, and I started my job six months later. We sold our house up in Newcastle, and we're now back into the one we live in now. Valuable lessons this taught me. Firstly, there is nothing more precious than having your friends and family around when things get tough. Secondly, always live within your means and never have a credit card bill ever again. (laughs) Proverbs 22 says, The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Never a truer word was spoken. Now, Proverbs majors mainly uh, significantly on wealth and money and the use of money. It's not about how much money you've got. That's not kind of the point. The point is what you do with it. And Proverbs 30 says, Two things I ask of you. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need, 
or I shall be full, and denied you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or I shall be poor, and steal, and profane the name of God. So I think here the writer of this prayer in Proverbs is saying, Look, don't make me rich or poor. Why should they say, Just give me what I need? Give me more, and I risk ignoring God. With too much wealth, I risk losing my contact with God, and that's what I depend on. I no need to to talk and to listen to you. Give me too little, and that could result in extreme action, like theft, and then I break one of the Ten Commandments. So why do I say it's not about how much? Well, in this parable of the rich fool, Luke isn't saying that wealth is bad. A successful business provides for employees It develops them. It treats the customers well. It provides good quality products. It has a social responsibility. It brings wealth not just to the individual, but to the community. A good business invests in their local community. Now, in this individual's business, this farmer, the rich farmer accumulates more than he needs by far. Wealth has become his way of life. He doesn't share the, share the excesses at all. But life's more than that. He knows that. And he says, well, that's for next year. But he never gets to see it. You fool, God says. So, it's not wrong to have money in the eyes of the Bible. But it is our responsibility as a custodian to use it wisely. Saving and making money gives us the opportunity to use it for good. The more we have, the more we can help those in need. Now, our church here is funded by the work of volunteers, by donations, by rental income from the premises, and we give £7,000 a year to charities and to mission agencies without any expectation of anything in return. So... If I'm to use this good, then how do I know that I've got enough to keep me and my family? Now, at this point, I can feel God's eyes rolling somewhat. Andy, have you not learned anything I have been teaching you? I have said I will look after you, provide you with what you need. I've demonstrated this to you already. Yeah, I know, God, but how can I be sure So now I can see God getting quite angry with me. In that kind of parent-to-child way, where the parents repeated themselves over and over again, and it's not got through to the child. Well, lucky for me, God has unconditional love. And I came across this reading. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things will be given to you as well. So what's that phrase? God works in mysterious ways. So the Bible also says that one who gives freely will also grow richer. Proverbs 11 says, Some give freely, yet grow all the richer. Others withhold what is due and only suffer want. A generous person will be enriched, and one who gives water will get water. And then a nod to this parable that we've heard this morning. The people curse those who hold back grain, but a blessing is on the head of those who sell it. So one way to look at this money we've got is about stewardship. God has given us this wealth, which is subjective. It's not about how much we've got. That's secondary. The wealth is bestowed on us by the grace of God for the time that we're on earth. And God expects us to use it widely for the benefit of God's world. God wants us to be righteous with money. So how then? Live generously. Expect nothing in return. So we do this by donations to church. 
direct debits to charities, giving sites, volunteer our time, give pastoral care. There's so many ways. And as a nation, we're a generous people. Children in Need raised £39 million this year. Alzheimer's Society raises £77 million annually from donations. And St John's Ambulance, £19 million. But it goes wrong when it becomes the focus of our lives. So it could go one of two ways. We could decide to worship wealth, or we could decide to worship with our wealth. Too much money can lead to pride of wealth. Proverbs 22 makes this quite clear, that God sees everyone equally. The rich and the poor have all this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Oppressing the poor in order to enrich oneself and give to the rich will only lead to loss. So too much money can lead to greed. And now a person with greed is never satisfied. Works in a business too. If you take the redevelopment of the Debenham site down in Guildford, the builder there wanted ten storeys, much higher than anything else we've got in Guildford. And he settled for eight after a local outcry from the, from the building and from the only people who live around. No aesthetic value, these two extra floors. Pure greed by the builder. And then dangerously, this can lead to exploitation. Absolute focus on money at the expense of friends and family. And probably their own wealth, as I've mentioned in Proverbs just before. Now, a good employer can increase profits. But they'll do it with employees, not at their expense. The employees will be the root of the profit, not the outfall from it. And where the rich fool went wrong is when he placed all his trust in his earthly possessions. Instead of giving away the excess harvest, he kept it. He refused to accept that God would have looked after his earthly needs. But God is in us and with us through all of our personal financial circumstances so that we can develop a deeper trust in him. A deeper trust. That's what I'm now learning. Through the financial thick and thick and thin, Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, I have learnt in whatever situation I am to be content. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secrets of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So we need enough, and to use it wisely for the glory of God. But we need something else, something stronger and lasting too. And as I've learnt in the research for this sermon this morning. Knowing that God will provide should I should will provide for me should be sufficient enough. Now for me, that is a bit like standing on a table, falling back and just relying on someone to catch me. But I am starting to learn through what these scriptures are saying. God's helped me before, and he continues to do so if I let God. God is there to catch me, financially and non-financially. Wealth isn't measured by the size of your wallet, but in doing the right thing with it, following the word of God, acting on the word of God, using the gifts of God that he's given us, financial and otherwise, and we will have all the riches that God is talking about, both here and in heaven. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Indeed, your heavenly Father knows that these are all the things you need. But strive first for the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen.